Women who laughed at her, it seemed she ran forever. Bill could see Johnny's hands like vines outlined on her pale skin. He could see the anger and humiliation in her face, and he knew that there would be trouble. So Bill kept running, running, running with the bay of dogs in his ear. Perhaps he imagined he could smell hot blood on their breath, and they followed the scent of his fear. His blood-wet, lacerated feet would have softened the crunching of the leaves. Then, there might have been a softer sound, almost like chewing, like dogs chewing and ripping flesh. And where was Johnny? He must have wondered. Perhaps the only thought of getting to the other side of the swamp and to his sister Mary, the blood running in his eyes, and the horse was left crimson from the mom's assault. Johnny's pretty black skin had shown slick with blood in the light of the torches. I imagine Bill must have thought about Johnny when the dogs stopped barking. He would later say he knew when they stopped following him. In his terror pain, he would have only seen the swamp. He knew if he could get across to his sister Mary, everything would be all right. So that's the lynching of Johnny Taylor. And so, um, and so my grandmother told me the story of her brother being lynched, but she didn't tell me the details. Those I had to, to make up on my own. But what she did tell me was that um, Bill, in the wake of what happened to his brother Johnny, went on a murderous rampage. And he killed a few white men before he was caught. It was around the time of the Depression and he dropped his ration card and a bloody pot of hay. And so he was given the electric chair. He was sentenced to it. And my grandmother told me that she took my mother with her down south to attend the electrocution. But when they did it, the power went out and they weren't able to, to do it. And nowadays, we know about the convict leasing system. And so that's what happens. And he was leased out after that. And uh, so this story is about what happened when she went. And it's called Hags and Haynes. you had you ain't gonna boss me no more I got salt for you so that I'm leaving on the midnight train to Georgia the train ride from Pennsylvania was tiresome and Mary's feet had swollen like sausages she took notice of the setting moon it was fat and full and she knew it would be morning soon her spirit lightened this my home, baby, she whispered into the face of her sleeping girl. They would be stopping again soon. She stretched her legs stiff from the long night and the small train seats. Her bladder was screaming. There had not been a bathroom open to colored folks since she left Pennsylvania, and the bushes were unwelcoming in the dark. An even darker man in a fancy suit, his eyes hidden beneath his hat passed him in the narrow aisle. That's a pretty black child you have there, ma'am, he told her, but left the chill in his wake. The baby whined just a little and stirred in her sleep. Mary turned her head to see where the man had gone, but she could find no one standing. Perhaps he had simply taken a seat. The train finally reached its destination shortly after dawn. Mary clutched her baby girl to her chest and began the five-mile walk to the jailhouse before they executed her brother. No use complaining, she figured. She better get used to the walking, for there was no chance of being chauffeured. She looked behind her. As she stepped beside the railroad tracks and headed for the woods, the train snaked across the horizon and then it disappeared in the distance. She was uneasy. There was an itch in her throat. She chanced to look back, and there was that man. The same man from the train in a pretty suit and hat. He stepped swiftly through the high grass and showed his teeth and tipped his hat further over his eyes when he saw her looking. And although he was not walking quickly, she could not shake the sensation that she was 